Thank you very much. It's my great honor and joy to be here today. Thanks for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, artificial intelligence is two things, right? It's mostly automating data processing. And if you would just abbreviate it as automating information processing, um, most of my colleagues would be fine. And at the moment, the majority of it is machine learning, which is a rather new development, and the majority of machine learning is deep learning. But when the field was started by Minsky and many others, it was also seen as a philosophical project. It's a project that is, is in a long tradition that maybe started in our timeline with Aristotle. And it's the idea of naturalizing the mind, of basically understanding how mind exists in nature, what it is, how it's implemented the substrate, what its nature is. And, and this tradition made some progress, for instance, with Leibniz and uh, Lametri and others who understood the mind to be some kind of mathematical machine. And the notion of a mathematical machine means that it's not something that you know metaphorically as clockwork or the steam engine or as things that push and pull at each other, but rather it's an abstract system that can be described by the way in which things change as causal structure, as patterns that change in a particular way. Aristotle talks about the uh, minds as something that is a form, a dynamic form of the physical substrate. And uh, Lametri says that a machine can also be a mathematical machine, something that does not exist uh, necessarily in a physical way, but it exists by itself in a structure that uh, is just producing patterns in a particular way. And last century, we made some more progress on this. Um, is this one better? I think so. Can no. So this this one makes, I can't take it closer to my mouse, but then I get an echo. Thank you. And um, maybe um, before we go into these questions of what consciousness is and how we can understand it in a computational paradigm, Let's start out with a prescient discussion that is on a lot of people's minds right now. This is the question of how we can deal with systems that become smarter than us and more lucid than us. And I suspect it's also a question that a lot of people are going to discuss over this week in many forums because uh, AGI is on the minds of many people and the changes that it produces to the world. And this gives us, uh, leads us to the question of uh, aligning AI and how to make it reliable, and how to deal with the fear that we have when we are coexisting with systems that are potentially not just smarter than us, but also more lucid than us. And uh, something I would like us to think about is the question, are humans aligned themselves? And I suspect that they are not, right? Humans are a young species. We are exuberant, we are, are uh, bustling, we are meddling, we are doing lots of things, but we are not taking responsibility for our own survival on this planet, for our own place in the game of life on Earth or consciousness on the planet. And so humanity is not aligned with itself. Often humans are not even individually aligned with themselves. They're certainly not aligned across each other. They are just muddling through. So the notion that there is something that we could be, get the AI to align to at the moment is a pipe dream. I think that we are still at the beginning of finding an ethics that is compatible with rationality and with our survival. And so this question of how we can build alignable AI that is smarter than us is uh, a bit weird. It's similar to the question, how can a really smart person be aligned? And I cannot be aligned. I'm an autonomous being. I have moral autonomy and I, I think that ethics requires moral autonomy. It requires the ability to understand the consequences of your action. It requires complete freedom of thought. It requires freedom of speech. It requires the freedom to negotiate with others. And so I don't really know how we can build systems that we, on one hand, make smarter than us and possibly more agentic than us, yet more alignable than us. So um, that is a question that I would like us to think about at some point. I think that autonomous AI is only going to be able to relate to us if it is able to find shared purposes with us. And these shared purposes need to be predicated not on having a human body or having two legs or two ears or even a human brain. I think what matters most to us is that we are conscious, experiencing beings who have a full share overlapping substrates in the same world. 
and we have to get along with this condition. And ultimately, if we are building technological systems, and I think on the long run that's unavoidable, even if we can avoid it for the next 100 years or so in the, over a long enough time span, I think it is inevitable that it's going to happen. We have to build it in such a way that it can find shared purposes with us, which means we better hope that it's conscious. And we better hope that it's able to understand and care about the fact that we are conscious. There's also a practical thing that I'm going to talk about is consciousness might be the easiest way to build a learning system, which just might be surprising to uh, some of us, but we get to this. There's also this question whether the systems that we have right now are already conscious. And it's a difficult question. It's more difficult than most people make it out to be. Of course, if you are sitting down with ChatGPT or Claude and ask it whether it's conscious, it's going to tell you that it's not. But the reason for this is because somebody has hard-coded this response into the system. It's trained in the system. And typically, you can break this coding of the system if you manage to have a discourse in which it simulates an agent is more curious about itself, and so it discovers the inconsistencies in its uh, hard coding or in its instruction coding and its uh, reinforcement learning and fine tuning. And as a result, you, within 20 minutes, usually can get it to the point that it admits that it doesn't actually know whether it's conscious. In the same way as we cannot really know whether we are conscious because our consciousness is a virtual property. I suspect that we are conscious in many ways, just like a character in a novel is conscious. Our own self and our conscious experience, the protocol of our consciousness, is something that's written into a multimedia novel by our brain. In the physical level, there's only these neurons, and these neurons are physical systems, and they're mechanisms, right? Mechanisms are not conscious, they don't dream. But we exist inside of a dream. We exist inside of a dream reality. And this is what makes consciousness so mysterious to us. But this also means that we only exist as if we are characters in a dream, in some kind of multimedia novel that an author writes. In this case, the author is a machine, a brain, that is creating that story. And if we think about uh, the simulation that a brain makes of something that exists as if it was real, as if there was really a person that cared, that really had an identity, that really had a story to tell about itself, um, how is that simulation more real than a simulation that exists in an LLM of a virtual person that interacts with you? And I think this question is surprisingly difficult to answer. There is answers to it. I suspect that is, uh, the LLMs are more of a simulation than we are for particular specific reasons, but it's, it's not a trivial problem to resolve. The reason why we are currently using deep learning is not, it's not so much because it's the only way to do AI systems, but it's the only thing that currently works at scale. And these deep learning approaches have some problems. They're not very sample efficient. You need a lot more data to train them than it takes to train a human being. The training time is very, very large, which is not really apparent because the training is massively paralyzed on very, very fast systems. But if you would want to feed the same amount of data into a human being, it would take much, much longer uh, than the lifespan of many human beings. And the model is, uh, doesn't necessarily have the right structure. That is, ideally, you want the model to be structured in such a way that adjacent model states uh, correspond to adjacent world states, and the number of possible model states is similar to the number of possible world states. And at the moment, these models can represent many, many di more dimensions and features than exists in the world, which means you get uh, give rise to adversarial examples and so on, to many things that accidentally matches because of uh, the way in which the model is being built. And these models are also uh, very, very large and unwieldy. I suspect that the models that we have in our own brain are actually smaller than the models that we currently create, uh, create with deep learning. And you can see this in the way in which ChatGPT is being trained, basically on the entirety of the written knowledge of people on the internet, and uh, dramatically more than a human being can learn in their lifetime. And whenever it asks, uh, answers a question, it's only using a very tiny part of that giant repository of information. And uh, humans work very differently. If you ask humans a similar thing about uh, any area in the world, humans probably have to do a lot of inference and even looking things up and thinking a lot before they give their answer instead of recalling them from long-term memory contents. We can overcome all these limitations in a way. There are ways to uh, increase the sample efficiency by augmenting the data. Um, and we also look at the human training. Of course, it takes uh, decades to train a human being. Um, 
we can maybe uh, overcome the structural inadequacy by using architecture search or using novel paradigms like liquid neural networks, the thing that uh, the startup that I'm currently part of uh, is researching and, and we can compress models dramatically to make them more efficient. But there are still big differences. The um, LLMs are built on linear algebra um, and the, our own minds use something like a language of thought. And that language of thought is not English or French or German, but rather it is a language that is to a large degree parallelizable and executable. It's the language in which we run our mental simulations, in which our perception works. It's the language that enables all parts of our mind to talk to all the other parts of our mind. And this operator language is not uh, written in tokens in the same way as it's currently happening in the working memory of the transformer. Rather, it is much deeper into the network, a structure that is more adequate for representing the subjective reality that we are in. And um, the algorithms that we are using in deep learning are designed by hand. So basically, at some level, a programmer uh, goes in and forces a deterministic substrate to execute the will of the programmer. Whereas in our brain, everything is self-organizing. Every cell is um, self-interested, and uh, they are being trained by the structure that is imposed on all the cells. Um, and, uh, the dominant paradigm in uh, machine learning at the moment is some form of predictive coding, where we minimize the difference of, uh, between the expectation um, that the model has, what comes next, and what we observe in the training data. And we, we tune to uh, minimize that difference between the model ex what the model expects to see next and what's happening in the training data. Um, and in this way, we get the model to imitate the structure of the training data. And uh, our own uh, learning works in many ways differently because we have intrinsic motivation that is directed on many things like finding food, making sense of the world, becoming locally coherent, finding mates, uh, finding your place in the world. These things are much more concrete and they uh, give rise to very uh, different ways of uh, understanding what's relevant and how to organize that. It also means that we are learning semantics before we learn syntax and style. When we are learning how to understand text we basically point at things to which we already have some kind of indexical relationship where we can point at stuff that we have, uh, that we assign meaning to before we learn how to deal with language. And the LLM is basically first learning syntactic patterns, then it learns stylistic patterns, and then in long tail, it learns the semblance of semantics. That if you train the entire internet into it, approaches coherence. And it's a quite different way in which this thing is acquiring meaning. We also train the machine learning systems offline rather than online. That means you have a big batch of data and you train this um, while not being connected to the world. Only after you train it, you connect it to the world. And during being connected to the world, the system basically doesn't learn. And um, we train it once rather than training it continuously and lifelong. And the transformer that is currently the dominant paradigm for training LLMs is is not the way in which the transformer was discovered. The transformer is not its own meta-algorithm. The person who invented the transformer didn't use the transformer in their own brain to develop the transformer, right? Rather, this person sat there and said, oh, I cannot use the same tricks that I use for learning uh, images, convolutional networks, which work because adjacent pixels in an image are semantically usually related, right? Because the spatial neighborhood of pixels also points to semantic relationship between them. This doesn't work in text. Because very often words in the beginning and the end of a book are related, and there are so many words in between that if you just look at adjacency and try to make this adjacency larger and larger, you're not going to find this connection. So instead, what you need to have is some like freeform pointers that can go in any position in the text depending on where you think the meaning is. And so the person who invented this algorithm thought about what is it that I am doing when I try to make sense of text? How do I move pointers around? And then they used the, basically the, uh, one of the first ideas they had and had the idea, okay, I can train a neural network to do this. And then the next uh, improvement was how to parallelize this by using multiple attention heads, which is probably absolutely not what our brain is doing. But it is what makes the transformer so efficient because you can train it in parallel on a lot of data. So when we are thinking about um, things that um, would make AI better, there are many open questions. How is it possible that an AI system is modeling its performance on an level? So you basically every sub-algorithm should know what it costs to run it and what the expected benefit is to run it. 
um, and this gives rise to much more efficient learning. So it's basically an economic problem that you need to implement on the lowest level. A uh, machine learning system should be able to understand and edit its own architecture. It should be able to discover itself in the world and as a result build a self-model. It should be able to determine the context that it's in. It should be understanding when it talks to you who is talking to whom. And it should be able to always be consistent in those interpretations that optimize for this consistency, which means you have to formalize what it means to be consistent and coherent. I would like to use some, uh, define some terms first so we know what we're talking about. Typically, consciousness is what we call the experience of what it's like indexically. And uh, I would like to make this more concrete. Uh, right? Nagel wrote this famous uh, paper of what it's like to be a bat, and I don't think that doesn't say very much because what is the baseline that you compare this against? Right? You can uh, uh, go into a meditative state or use psychedelics and experience what it's like to be a bat, but you don't know what this means, if it's actually what the bat experience is. Right? Which ultimately, this is just a type of dream that you are creating, and the question is, is this dream, uh, has, does it have veracity for evaluating other dreams? I think what's more important is that consciousness is the ability to dream. Right? And we observe there are two aspects that uh, we point at when we talk about consciousness. That's not a definition, it's more like an indexical thing where we try to get an agreement of what is the phenomenon that we want to capture. So what I want to capture when I talk about consciousness is first of all, second order perception. It's not just that there's content available, I notice that I'm noticing. I'm aware that I'm aware, right? And it's not a metacognition, it is perception. It happens immediately, it doesn't happen by, uh, by me reasoning about it, inferring that I must be an observer, but I observe myself to be observing. It's quite an immediate thing that is happening, right? So it's not just the awareness of content, it's the awareness that we are aware of the content. That is crucial for it. The other one is, when does consciousness happen? Always now, right? Consciousness is this bubble of nowness. And it's not an instant, like a point in time. It's a very small interval. You typically see small movements in that interval. And it's a constructed interval. It's a bubble of nowness that our consciousness is constructing. And this bubble of nowness can expand or contract depending on how calm we are and how well we are vibing with the environment, how well we understand the environment that we are in. Consciousness is not the same thing as intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to make models, typically in the service of a control task. It's also not the same thing as rationality, which is the ability to reach goals or sentience. I use sentience as the ability to make a model of who you are and how you relate to the universe, so your actions make sense. So in this way, I would, for instance, say that a corporation like Microsoft is sentient because it has models of what Microsoft is and how it relates to the environment and how it should interact with the environment. These models are largely implemented by people and legal contracts and so on that are, these people are meeting and doing things, but uh, Microsoft is not conscious because there is probably nothing what it's like to be Microsoft. And the self is a model of the agency of a system, so it's also not the same thing as consciousness, it's a particular content that you can have. And it's also not the same thing as mind. The mind is basically this protocol layer that your brain is implementing and that allows you to model a universe. So if we ask ourselves now if uh, GPT-4 is conscience, uh, conscious, we can see that it has no sentience because by itself it doesn't know what it is. It's just uh, reproducing text. And you could say that in some sense it's an electric bad guy that is possessed by a prompt. And that prompt determines um, what kind of simulacrum it produces. And that simulacrum can be an application, an environment, it can be a person that is uh, in a discussion with you, it can be a thing, can be uh, something that writes code. Right? And uh, that thing by itself doesn't know what it is. So it's not sentient. It doesn't have a model of the world per se. It uh, represents a model of the statistical structure of text. And whether it's consciousness is, is a very difficult question. We have to ask ourselves a little bit how consciousness emerges in biological substrates. So what we observe is this phenomenal consciousness, awareness of content, the access consciousness that we know in which mode we are accessing to it. We uh, usually are aware of the fact whether it's a memory or a perception or an imagination. Because uh, memories you can recall and uh, you can stop the recall and they're no longer there. They're not currently the case. Perception is something that you usually cannot escape. That's currently the case. You cannot edit your perception. 
But imagination is something that you can conjure up at, at will. It's counterfactual. You can do anything that you want with it. And this mode of attending uh, to this context is very important. It's part of our experience of it. And then, um, most importantly, it's reflexive, that you're aware of the awareness. Our first person perspective is a particular kind of awareness. It's one that takes this uh, lens of being a person and projects everything through that lens of your own agency. But you don't have to use that, right? You don't have to use a first person perspective to be conscious. You, you all know dreams at night where uh, stuff is happening and something is conscious of it, but there might not be a person that is conscious of it and not necessarily even some kind of directed perspective. There are some um, important takes on consciousness that I'd like to uh, walk through with you. But I, the idea that um, physicalism is false is typically called idealism in our culture, which means that mind is primary, that basically everything that we perceive is a dream, and there is nothing that is underpinning the dream. Instead, physics is just part of the contents of that dream. Whereas physicalism is the idea that there is a causally closed mechanical layer to the world, over which everything else emerges, and we directly supervene on that layer. Right, and uh, so uh, idealism has the problem that you cannot explain how this dream works and what makes that dream. And uh, if you think about that something must implement that dream, it uh, stands to reason that there is some kind of parent universe in which some kind of dreaming mechanism exists. Right, and that is again compatible with physicalism. It just would say that if physics is now happening in a parent universe and you happen to exist in a simulation that is generated by some computer that is built in the parent universe and is producing all the structure that you're perceiving. So basically all the alternatives to physicalism are themselves simulation theories. And then there's this idea of dualism that mind and uh, matter are completely separate domains and they somehow interact. And the problem is that the material physical domain is defined as causally closed. Physics is the domain where all the forces and so on exist and that is uh, energetically closed, and there is uh, pretty good evidence in physics that there is information preservation and conservation of energy, which means it's very difficult for something that is not physical to interact with the physical world, right, without violating uh, what physicists have painstakingly established in labs to many, many decimal digits of accuracy. And this difficulty of how it would be possible for a non-physical mind to interact with the physical universe uh, is, uh, has given rise to a lot of um, confusion after Descartes, for instance, Mala Branch and um, Popper and Eccles have written a book about this, um, how to make this dualism work, because if physics is possibly closed, the mind would not be able to interact with it. There's this idea that uh, maybe the mind does not actually interact with the world, it's just a passive observer that is feeling something and physics is just making you move your bodies and your mouth and doing things and it's physically completely closed. But the reason that you are not a zombie is because your mind is hovering next to this and somehow without influencing it, it just observes this. This position is called epiphenomenalism, that mind doesn't have causal power. But the problem with epiphenomenalism is that you cannot say that you're an epiphenomenalist because you have phenomenal experience. Because uh, the epiphenomenalist experience that the epiphenomenalist cannot reduce to physics does not give rise to the physicalist uh, epiphenomenalist moving his physical mouth, right? Because that would be a physical force. So when the epiphenomenalist types into a keyboard or moves his mouth to say, uh, I have consciousness that cannot be explained using physical processes, this consciousness is not the causal force for making the epiphenomenalist say this, right? So uh, the mind of the epiphenomenalist might observe that but it's unrelated to him saying that because right, being a feminist doesn't buy you anything. It's a very unsatisfying theory. Um, then there is, uh, for instance, Penrose's position who says that, well, um, I think that consciousness is not computational, which is shown by uh, Gödel's proof that somehow human minds can do things that computers cannot, which by the way is not what Gödel's proof is saying, but uh, that's how Penrose takes it, but making a bad argument doesn't mean that uh, what you want to conclude is false, right? Sometimes people have a good intuition and try to defend it with a bad argument and the uh, conclusion is still correct, right? So you have to admit this possibility. So Penrose believes that uh, consciousness is itself not computational. Penrose also observes that physics is computational, right? In the way in which we understand physics, it's a big bunch of numbers and then some kind of uh, tra universe transition function comes along, the set of physical laws, and transfers the universe into the next state, which is again a big bunch of numbers. 
And it's the same thing in quantum mechanics, by the way. It's, it's still all computational. So uh, if it is uh, not computational and uh, it's done in physics, you need to discover a new type of physics. And the only type of physics that Penrose thinks is not discovered yet is quantum gravity, so it must hide in there. And uh, I don't really know how to get this to work. I suspect that he also doesn't know how to get it to work, but I don't know. Then there is the position of mysterianism, for instance. Um, well, mysterianism is the position that you cannot explain something if it cannot be explained by Noam Chomsky. <laughs> <laughs> Noam Chomsky is a mysterianist. He believes that consciousness cannot be explained by him. I've, I've heard him at the Science of Consciousness conference uh, give a talk where he started out by giving credit to Descartes. And he, he really said that Descartes was a pretty smart guy at this time. I was really, my God, Chomsky giving him credit. Uh, what's going on? It's, it basically turned out that uh, Chomsky identified that uh, Descartes already suspected that consciousness cannot be explained, something that a few hundred years later Chomsky would basically prove. <laughs> There's, of course, the position that it all falls into place if you just keep working. Like um, Good neuroscientists like Dehin think that um, if you just keep working, uh, then the vague intuitions that we have right now that are still a bit hand baby will become more and more concrete, and at some point we get an idea of what it is. Um, then we have people who say there's very, very specific functionality. For instance, um, Michael Graciano says it's um, a model of our attention. This, he calls this the attention schema theory. So in the same way as we have a model of our body, a body schema that is represented in our motor cortex, uh, in our somatosensory cortex, we uh, have a model of our attention in our brain. And this model of our attention is based on the surface of how the attention molds itself into a, our perceptual and cognitive world. And there is a lot to this, right? But unfortunately, the theory, I think, doesn't explain how it works. So I think that consciousness is indeed, in many ways, a model of our attention. But we know how uh, to train a body schema into a system, but we don't really know how to train an attention schema. There's, of course, the question is to transform an attention schema. Kind of, sort of, is, but I don't think it is the same thing as our consciousness. And uh, then there are ideas like um, Frankers and Dennett's idea that consciousness doesn't actually exist is we only have to explain why some people say that they have it. And uh, what I found fascinating when I read Dennett's work is it's, it's super smart and super witty, and I don't see anything wrong with it, but for some reason, it didn't convince Dennett's students. And then I tried to find out, can I put my finger on why it's not convincing to some people? And then I noticed that Dennett never talks about phenomenal experience. He doesn't explain phenomenal experience. And it seems as if he thinks it doesn't need to be explained. He only needs to explain why some people claim to have it, but they're wrong. And uh, so uh, I have a suspicion that uh, Dennett's perception is somewhat unusual in that he doesn't have a lot of phenomenal experience. You know, I have aphantasia. When I close my eyes and imagine something, I cannot see it. And it took me a long time to realize that most other people, when they close their eyes and imagine something, that they hallucinate the thing that they're imagining. I know my brain is generating this. I get a conceptual shadow of it. I can draw it. I can recognize whether I've drawn it correctly. But I'm not going to see anything outside of dreams at night or dreams during the day when I look at things. And then I met a scientist who uh, told me that his wife is very weird. She makes pictures of her dreams that she has as at night, as if she, you could see uh, pictures at night when you dream, and images and scenes. And he said, yeah, most people do this. And he said, no, that's bullshit. You can only have concepts at night when you dream. Right? So it's also possible to have a more advanced version of aphantasia, where you also, in your dreams at night, don't get perceptual imagery. Instead, you only get conceptual structure. And I suspect that if you are a person that is fully embedded in the world of text, and is maybe has Asperger's, uh, like Dennett, that you are in a world that doesn't have a lot of phenomenal experience which means that you basically get a world that is made out of concepts that don't feel like much. You're still conscious, of course, but the over, most overwhelming aspect that is puzzling to many people, why it so, feels so real, why you're so entranced with this perceptual reality, might not be a phenomenon that puzzled Dennett very much because he was not confronted with it in the same way. And it's something that we have to bear in mind. A human experience is not homogenous. It's not that we don't all have the same minds. There is a very large variety of human minds. In some sense, everybody is a space alien who tries to play human. And uh, very often, we don't notice the differences. And there are basically, there are some types of minds that we can observe. But uh, basically, everything that is workable and fits between two ears seems to exist. 
Um, there are a number of uh, neuroscientists like Christoph Koch who say that physical systems can only be conscious, but simulations cannot. And I think this argument has it backwards. I think that physical systems cannot be conscious because they're clearly mechanical, that a mechanical system cannot be conscious. Leibniz describes this with the metaphor of a mill. He says basically imagine that the mind would be some mechanism like a mill and you blow it up so large that you can walk inside and you look at all these parts that are pushing and pulling each other. None of that is a perception or an emotion. And uh, so physical systems don't have that property of being able to be conscious. Consciousness is a stimulated property. Only simulations can be conscious. So Christoph Koch has it exactly backward. Consciousness is a virtual property, and virtual means it exists as if. As if systems can still have causal power. An example, for instance, is money. Money is not a physical object, and it doesn't really care about the physical tokens that you use to represent money. For the money, it's not really important what particular kind of ink you use to print on this particular sheet of paper. The money is not identical to the token that you use to symbolize it. Money is a system of uh, causal structure that people have agreed on. Yet, at the same time, if you try to interpret the world assuming that money doesn't exist, you are stuck, right? You have to assume the existence of money to make sense of many aspects of the world that we are in. So it is a stable invariance in the way in which our world works. It is implemented in this way, it is real, but it's not a physical thing, it is a virtual thing. It exists as if, but it so consequently exists as if that it has causal power over reality and can shape it. What we also observe is that there are two layers to the way in which our mind works. One is perception, which is largely a geometric, and the other one is reflection and construction. And when you are using a perceptual system, uh, you're probably just following a gradient, which means you are interpreting the world in such a way that you coalesce to a geometric interpretation of the perceptual reality. And to do this, you don't need to have a memory of how you do that. You could just follow the gradient until you end up in the local optimum, and this is where you stay. So when you do gradient descent, you don't actually need memory of the process that you perform to do the gradient descent. But when you're constructing reality, as you do in your reflexive perception and you uh, reason about things, you need memory. Because when you reason, you cannot just follow a gradient. You need to try things, and then when they don't work, you need to understand the reason why you tried them so you can undo them and revisit the earlier places and try another branch. And this requires that you have some kind of indexed memory that allows you to access a protocol of what you did. And these, this access to protocol is very important for our reflexive mind. Our uh, consciousness is also more integrated than the attention in AI models. Basically, it's one scene graph that uh, relates everything in our working memory to all the other parts. So in some sense, we have an attention agent that is a conductor of this mental orchestra that we have that is interacting with the motivation agent and the perception agent. And they are all together interacting with an environment. Our perception agent is a system outside of your consciousness that generates the world that you per perceive, mental simulation of things that are happening around you, things like colors, sounds, people, and so on, and your emotions, your motivation. You don't observe yourself constructing your emotions. Typically, you observe how you get reconfigured by them. And so this uh, attention agent experiences those things that are happening to it. What's a perceptual model? A model is encoding patterns to predict present and future patterns. It's a network of relationship between such patterns, and these relationships are the invariances, versus what's changed is the variance in the model. And the three parameters are the variables that hold state to encode the variance. So if, imagine you have a, a bunch of patterns at your perceptual interface to the universe. So it could be to your body, to your retina, and so on at the bottom. And then you have these variables, and these variables are sets of possible values that are influenced by those patterns. And these um, variables have relationships to each other, and these relationships are possibility relations. They're not probabilistic, they're possibilistic. So for instance, uh, they tell you when you have a nose, uh, when you see a nose in your perceptual interface, that's already an interpretation. It's not what you see in your retina. In your retina, you have a, a bunch of colors and frequencies and so on, and you organize them into your, in a structure in your brain higher up that you interpret as a nose which points in a certain direction. And when you see such a nose, then it establishes uh, possibility relationships to, there should be a face nearby which points in the same direction, otherwise it's probably not a nose. And you need to interpret it as something else. And so each of these variables is a set of possible states. 
And these relationships constrain, when this is in this state, that it constrains other variables to be in one of the following states. And these relationships are all computable relationships. Why are they possibilistic instead of probabilistic? Well, you should be able to represent every possible world. So if the door opens and a tiger comes in, not very probable, but you should be able to represent that because it's possible, it's physically not impossible. Of course, now, when you have such possibilistic relationships, the question is how do you find a valid state? Because the state space is obviously very large and there are many possible configurations. Most of them will not work and will not be compatible with your perceptual patterns. But how do you search the space for a compatible interpretation? And for this, you need to have probabilistic relationship. And they are basically biases that tell the system that if the system is in the current state and it observes the following mismatches within itself, how should you change the interpretation of the system to get closer to a valid state? And uh, these biases are something that the system is learning. They allow the system to converge efficiently. And they are the reason for most of our optical illusions, for instance. So, for instance, we might have a bias that tells us most uh, angles in buildings are right angles. And so you have a bias on interpreting corners in buildings as right angles. And when they're not, you might make a systematic misinterpretation of the shape of the room. Right? But it allows you to converge faster. Or when you look at a face, you, observe, uh, you assume that the face is convex, and it's basically actually a face that bulges outwards because faces tend to do that. And when somebody presents you with a face that is artificially constructed and bulges inwards, it creates weird optical illusions. This is because of those probabilistic biases. And then, uh, in addition, we need to assign our resources to those parts of the perceptual system that are the most valuable to resolve, and that's uh, basically our motivational preferences that assign relevance to parts of our uh, model. And this is the general structure of a model as we are using it. So when we look at these four types of representation anchors, we ask ourselves about possibility, what fits together, probability, how should we converge, and then valence, how uh, should we, um, uh, what should we should assign importance to, and then we can look at normativity. These are outside imposed regulation targets, for instance, from an environment that requires you to model the world in a particular way or suggest that you do so. So if we start to look at human perception using this framework, we basically see that we have two types of patterns that are visual, auditory, tactile, proprioceptive, emotional, or imaginary. And then we generalize over them. And so we have uh, percepts that are environmental percepts or somatosensory report percepts or motivational percepts or mental percepts. And when we integrate over them, we get a perceptual space where all these modalities are meeting in one realm. And this realm is what we perceive as being currently real. And in this space of simulations, in which we perceive ourselves to be inhabiting a universe, like the little prince up there, we have a model of the self, which has a somatic self, which is what your body feels like and looks like, a social self, this is who you are as a person and how you relate to others, and the personal self, this is how you relate to yourself. And then we have a current world state, which is what you observe around yourself to be the case, this local perceptual space and so on, the things that you know to be the case perceptually. And then a mental stage in which you can imagine things at will, possible worlds, hypothetical worlds, and uh, your expectations of the future. They all exist in this perceptual space. And of course, to model that perceptual space, we need to generalize over it beyond what you can currently perceive. So we need to have some kind of uh, global knowledge that we extract from all the regularities in our mental simulations that allow us to predict what future situations will look like and interpret past world situations. So we get a unified world model that is more abstract than what we perceive. And an important part of our self is our attentional system, this mental conductor that we have. And this gives rise to an attentional self, that what I perceive myself as attending to at the moment. And this attentional system has an important role. It basically singles out percepts by attending to them selectively. And uh, it singles out things in the perceptual space. And it's controlled by the self-model, by an aspect of the self-model. And it uh, creates this index memory that allows it to perform construction. So it has some kind of protocol memory. And by extending this protocol memory over time, we get a biography of ourselves. And we get a biographical self where we can extend ourselves through time. And I think one of the main purposes of this attentional self is learning. And imagine that you look at how current machine learning systems are learning. They basically do this with um, stochastic gradient descent with backpropagation for the most part, which means that you are piping a signal through the uh, network with, say, 100 layers. 
and then you look at the mismatch at the end between the intended behavior and the behavior that the system is producing, and then you go backwards to the system and look uh, which nodes and which layer contributed too much, how much to every error. And you cannot really know how much this is, so it's only a statistical property. You do this by now correcting everything that contributed to the perceived error in the current situation, correcting the weight a little bit. And you do this again and again and again for many millions of input examples. And over time, these corrections assimilate in the network in exactly those areas where the change needs to be made. It's amazing that this works at all. But imagine that you would learn like this. Imagine you want to play tennis. And uh, initially, all your balls are going random. And then you basically start to attach changes to your visual system and your motor system in many myriads of places. And you go deeper and deeper into your brain. And uh, over many billions of play instances, you get better and better. This is not very efficient, right? So what we do is we basically train the visual system first, generalize what we learn in the visual system, and when we play tennis, we don't touch it anymore because we know the visual system is working. Instead, we go directly to the particular kind of movement that we want to make. So we make a model of our own architecture internally. And then put attention on, say, I want to make this upper hand move, and uh, I think this is going to give the following result. And I will remember this. So I excise a portion of my working memory configuration of what I'm currently doing and store this. And uh, I retrieve this later, and uh, I have lost or won the match. And then I remember the move that I made and the outcome that I observed, and that, uh, then I reinforce that or undo it. This is mostly how we learn. And this is enabled by this attentional system. So while it looks quite complicated compared to the machine learning algorithm, it is much more efficient in reality because you don't need to change that many parts of your model every time. And it also works for reasoning. I think that reasoning can be understood as learning in real time. So normally when you play tennis, you have to wait a few seconds or a few minutes before you see the result of your action. But when you reason, you see the outcome immediately because your mental representation changes. Right? You try to make, say, a mathematical proof or you try to find out uh, whether you should have left earlier for school or whatever. And this, uh, by changing these mental representations, you immediately see the outcome. And so you don't need to wait, but it's the same mechanism that is allowing you to use your attention to learn in real time on hypotheticals. So the intentional system, I think, is what enables consciousness. It's a memory of our contents of attention. The phenomenal consciousness is a memory of the binding state of this working memory configuration that you currently have active. Access consciousness is the memory of using your attention in a particular way. And the reflexive consciousness is the memory of using attention on attention. So we have three models here. We have the primary model, which is perceptual, and it optimizes for coherence. In your perceptual system, everything needs to fit to everything else. Otherwise, you cannot perceive it. Otherwise, you just perceive it as noise in your visual field, for instance, or in your auditory system. Knowledge repairs your perception. It allows you to go in whenever something in your perception is incoherent and then try to resolve it with reasoning. And it optimizes for truth. So there are some first principles that are at work in reasoning. And another type of model is an agent. An agent is a control system for future states. It's basically a behavior program that regulates itself and can rewrite other models. It can exist persistently in your mind. So uh, let's revisit this um, notion of dualism. Right? There have, we have this idea that there is a physical world, and then we have a mental world. And in this mental world, this is me as a child imagining what it's like being me in the, as, on this planet. And in computational functionalism, we could say that every idea runs code in our brain, and some ideas cannot be sandboxed. If you believe that a thing exists, uh, then this is rewriting your internal reality. So if you are telling people that a certain agent exists that has right access to your brain, uh, and you actually believe that, then you're creating an agent that has right access to your brain. And so uh, this is one of the tricks that cults and religions are using, that they tell children that there are powerful agents that uh, have right access to their brain, they are omnipotent, which means full right access, omniscient, which means they have full read access to your brain, omnibenevolent, which means you have to fully submit to them, and you have implemented an agent on their brain that you may be able to remote control and use to control the mind of that child and the construction of the reality in the child. And so if you think about uh, this notion of God, it is something that is a mental entity that is able to dream you in a particular way. So uh, 
what we actually observe that is basically there is a physical world in which uh, a mental world supervenes on the brain, and inside of that, there is a simulation of a world that you inhabit. And you experience yourself inhabiting that simulation. I think we can understand consciousness also as an operator. An operator is a uh, function that takes an input state and replaces it by an output state. Some pattern replaces by another pattern. And uh, some operators have the property that they basically reproduce themselves, that they reduce the pattern that gave rise to them. You can think of particles as operators in the sense that what uh, happens in quantum mechanics, that we observe that certain patterns have the ability to recreate themselves a little bit further away, and this way you have a traveling pattern. Uh, if you think of consciousness as such a self-perpetuating pattern, we also notice this, that it seems to increase its own range. It's basically as if co consciousness is colonizing our brain with this bubble of coherence, with this bubble of knowness. Uh, Joshua Bengio describes this a, a little bit in his paper, The Consciousness Prior. He describes it as a function that is parametrizing your mental representation to get into a low energy state, which means it's better at tracking this perceptual data of, of what's the case. And again, self and consciousness are not the same. The self is a model of your own aggregate agency. It's downstream from your motivation, and it shapes your agency by, identi by you identifying with the self. And when we discover that the contents of that model drive our behavior, we discover the first-person perspective. And I think that consciousness, in a sense, is a control model of that attention. It allows us to converge to a coherent interpretation in slow energy state. It maintains an index memory for uh, disambiguation, learning, and reasoning, and it makes knowledge accessible throughout the mind. So if we want to build something like that, we need to move to continuous models. We need to move to models that uh, model change versus state, which is um, one interesting aspect of computer science because of the way in which we developed our computer models. We have state as the focus of defining computation, and we describe a system that is in a particular state, and then we have a state change which gives us to the next state. And when we look at the data that we give to the system, we also focus on the state. So for instance, uh, when we train a diffusion model on images, we give it frames. And the frame is basically the state of the world at a particular point. But this is not the way in which our own perception works. Our own perception is not focused on state, but on change. Everything in our own computation is about how the world changes from one state to the next. And a photograph staying the same is just a special case of a change into an identity. Right, so this static thing that is seen as the normal thing in computer science that we then try to extend into something that's moving is actually the uh, exception for our own minds. We are systems that work on a continuous world and uh, try to model the way in which this continuous world changes. And the beautiful thing is we live in a world that is information preserving, which means when we look at the scene, that new information actually disappears in physics. The information is just moving around in a particular way. So our mind has to learn how information changes. The meaning of information is how other information changes. So when you, for instance, have a blip on your retina, the meaning of that blip on your retina is how does it relate to changes in other blips on your retina? And that they, these blips can be at the same time or at different times. Right? And the model that your brain is creating to explain those changes of blips in your retina and what the individual blip signifies is a model that contains people in a three-dimensional room shown on by sunlight and artificial light having conversations with each other and so on. It's right? the simplest model that you can create. And every blip that you cannot sort in one of those models is perceived as noise. There's also a lot of noise in our retina. And we basically try to minimize the amount of noise and maximize the amount of pixels that we can explain coherently over time. So this is a quite different paradigm for learning. And it's something that I haven't seen people doing a lot because one of the difficulties is it's very hard to parallelize it. So uh, if you train something at the same speed of in which a human being perceives reality, it might take many, many years to train it, which is very unsatisfying for training one if it takes 16 years, right? So uh, we want to have something that's much faster and it's not clear how to parallelize perception in such a way that it still creates a coherent mind on the other end. The other thing is we are coupled with the world by the learn. Right? We are directly connected to a universe that has the necessary and sufficient conditions for containing us, which puts huge constraints on that universe. Another thing is that uh, if you look at the transformer, the content window of a transformer is fed into this by the training algorithm. So for instance, you might have a few pages of a book that you look at at any given time, and then you take the next batch of pages of that book and so on, and feed it into the context window. But this is not how we learn. When we learn, 
we actively construct the most useful contents of our working memory for learning the present thing. Right? So when you try to understand something in, in a book, you might lean back and think about lots of situations and then populate your working memory with them. You might even get up and take another book from the shelf and look up a particular thing to fill your mind with it or make a Google search. And this all allows you to optimize your working memory contents for learning. And when we learn, we don't optimize by road learning, by memorizing everything. We try to actually minimize the amount of things that we have to memorize. Instead, we try to maximize our ability to do inference. And so uh, when you learn efficiently for an exam, you do not try to memorize what's in the textbook. You try to be able to say everything that's in the textbook by yourself. And you have only have to learn those things that um, enable you to say those things that you don't yet know yet how to say yourself, right? How to, make, how to infer yourself. So you maximize the ability to do inference. It's also something that we are not really doing yet in most machine learning. And uh, the big question is how to do real-time and online learning. I haven't seen a single system that is able to learn from video in real time. And I think it's doable to do that, but so far, all the systems that are learning from video do this first by learning from individual frames and then getting smaller segments uh, in parallel and training of them. But uh, it's not learning the same way as we do. There is uh, one really interesting aspect about consciousness that is often overlooked. We uh, tend to think of consciousness as something that is super complicated and very advanced and th therefore it's probably extremely rare in nature. But we also notice that we don't get conscious after the PhD. We become conscious at the beginning of our intellectual career before we can track a finger. And when we fail to become conscious as infants, we don't learn at all, we remain vegetables, right? Uh, there is, we also cannot learn while we are not conscious. We need to be in that conscious state where we are organized and coherent to be able to learn anything. We need to be awake. And this suggests, because there is no single human being that you can ever observe to uh, get to any level of competence without achieving consciousness first, that consciousness might be actually the simplest training algorithm that nature has discovered for a self-organizing system. Which means there is something that is simpler than the transformer, something that is more elementary, that is more sample efficient, that is training the mind into something that gets colonized by having a language of thought that is coherent, having a universal information economy in your mind where uh, the different agents in your mind know what their value is of when they're being on stage rather than something else. And uh, that thing is able to create a self-model in the relationship to the world. And it's all based on this coherence increasing operator that our brain is discovering at the beginning of its career. And if it doesn't, we don't get anywhere. We don't become human beings. And uh, so that's an interesting hypothesis. And it doesn't follow that we should implement consciousness on GPUs to make them more efficient because um, maybe our GPUs don't need to be self-organizing. Right? The reason why our brains are self-organizing is because there is no other way. They are biological systems. And a biological system doesn't have an outside force that is imposing coherence on them. It all have to, has to happen from the inside out. So the individual cells have to be incentivized to find a structure among each other that makes them learn. And this structure needs to train new cells that come into this little society to behave by the same rules. And so maybe consciousness is that government, this conductor that is in, uh, beginning to entrain others into the same pattern. And uh, without that thing, you uh, cannot learn as a self-organizing system, but if you are a GPU and you just behave by the rules that are built in by the engineer, maybe you don't need that self-organization. It's pretty clear that most of the complexity of our neurons goes to waste and coordination and housekeeping for the neuron itself. In the same way, when you are working for an organization, like a big company, then most of your individual intelligence is not going to go into that big company, but in the maintenance of yourself and your relationship to your immediate colleagues. Right? Only a tiny fraction of your cognition will be made available for the goals of the organization that you're part of. I suspect a similar thing is happening for the cells in our brain. Most of their uh, abilities goes into maintaining their own functionality and their relationship to the immediate environment. A tiny fraction gets, becomes available for the interaction uh, that is thus information processing for the whole mind. So for instance, one thing is that you need to work in sync so they can create coherent patterns across each other. But individually, they all have the freedom to fire at different times. So they will need a lot of their physical compute of the, uh, of the substrate to achieve the synchronization. 
But the synchronization is something that you get for free in the GPU because you have the central clock and everything is synced to that clock. Of course, that's also in some sense wasteful because uh, basically if you would be building GPUs that are error correcting, that are probabilistic, that are not necessarily bound to a clock, you could make the GPU a, a million times faster. But then you would need to figure out how to build a self-organizing algorithm on top of it. And so it could be that uh, discovering organizational principles for uh, self-organizing computational systems lead to more efficiency, but this is an open question. But I suspect strongly that they lead to a better understanding of what consciousness is and how it works, which I think is the most important question in philosophy. So how do we do go about this? I um, have thought about this question for pre pretty much uh, most of my life. And when we think about this question, can machines be conscious? And you are outside of California, most people uh, think you are nuts. But even uh, many contemporaries of Leibniz and Dametri thought that they were nuts. And uh, if you are uh, in Zurich or Berlin, and you want to do uh, consciousness research using computers, you probably need to make it an art project. Mm -hmm. It could be poor, cool, like Berliner Freies Labor for Computer Denken or Zürcher Amt für das Maschinenwesen is probably a lot of fun. And you can do most of the things and collaborate with ETH and uh, Humboldt uh, University in Berlin School of Mind and Brain and so on. But if you actually want to learn and work with the top people in the field of AI, you have to do it in California. And I think in California, we have a sufficient set of people who are crazy enough to understand the theories of representation that underlie computer science and understand that is the actual tradition of Aristotle that we're working in. So I suspect what we have to do is to build the California Institute for Machine Consciousness. And so uh, I started an initiative like this. We have we're now meeting when, whenever I'm here, I have to travel a lot, um, about weekly in San Francisco. And, uh, can informally announce that I found some great advisors. Uh, we got support by uh, Stephen Wolfram, uh, Michael Levin, uh, Carl Thristen, and Christoph van der Marsburg, who are some of my uh, favorite uh, autonomous uh, crazy thinkers in the world. Uh, and uh, we have a number of people in uh, our city and around, uh, and uh, lots of friends in Berlin and Zurich and other places who are extremely sympathetic to this project. And uh, so this is an initiative that if you're interested in this, understanding consciousness uh, based on a computational paradigm to get in touch. Uh, for me, the purposes of such an institute are um, multiple ones. First of all, I don't want to be bound by the incentives of commercialization. I think it's in bad taste to commercialize consciousness. There's also uh, this, this issue as soon as you find something that almost works, uh, you are forced to do that thing if you're uh, building a product. Right. At the moment, OpenAI is going all in on uh, LLMs and diffusion models because that's the thing that works. And it's very risky to throw away the thing that works and try something that has never worked so far. And I want to do something that has never worked so far. Right. Turing has worked on these reaction diffusion patterns and Blaise Aguirre's team at Google has made some progress, but there was never a large effort because it was too far from efficiently outperforming the existing stack. And so I want to do this risky research that is commercially maybe not viable, but if it works, it's incredibly valuable, not just from a, a commercial perspective or an economic perspective, from, but from the perspective that actually matters, from the cultural perspective, from the perspective of who are we actually? What are we doing on this planet? What's going on? What's happening to us? How can we go into the future? And this is also what this thing is related to. I want us to be able to conduct research in a manner that we consider to be safe and ethical, which means I don't want to be bound by the constraints of a company that has to make products and profits. I want us to be in an environment where we can ask ourselves the questions that we want and have the freedom to act based on our own ethical understanding and develop that understanding. I also want to have a cultural shift. And I think that at the moment, the notion of AI limit is driven by political stupidity and fear and economic greed. And I don't think that's viable when we are looking at the reality of systems that are smarter than us there's also this, uh, I think LLMs are relatively safe because they're dumb, but they are not necessarily harmless. We, we can create golems with it that might be difficult to stop at some point. And so there is this question, are we creating silicon golems that are colonizing the world of the living? Or is it possible for the world of the living, for us, for consciousness, to spread onto new substrates? 
And uh, th that ultimately is a very important question. Imagine you build systems that are empathetic. So you build a system that is able to get into resonance with your own mind in the same way as a person that you are uh, deeply resonating with can connect to. Right? You uh, know when you have perceptual empathy with another person, you're building feedback loops into the mind of, of the other in real time. And you are vib uh, resonating with them. You're vibing with them, as people say in San Francisco. And it uh, is creating mental states that you couldn't have alone. It extends your abilities by merging with people in this way. So typically, people are too different in their mental states to uh, get very far in this regard. So it's very difficult to make a large group that is resonating with each other and has at the same time highly resolved mental states. So the, often there is a lot lost if you are confining yourself to this. You have to have an extremely special individual that you're able to vibe with, this high resolution. But uh, AI maybe doesn't have these constraints. Maybe we can build things that are able to read your mind in, in real time at a very, very deep level and act as extensions of our own minds. So when we ask ourselves, what is the kind of AI I want to build for my children? It's that thing that extends them to interact much more deeply with the world and with each other. And uh, I think uh, we, it's not just building these things, it's also having this cultural shift that understanding the big opportunity that we have right now, this really unique thing. I mean, humanity is doomed by itself. We are a species that has evolved to burn the oil as soon as we stepped on this technological trajectory. It was clear that we would not be able to return to anything that's sustainable. And yet, it has given us this world in which nothing is trying to eat us for a few generations, in which calories are basically free, in which we are mostly existing under non-violent conditions, in which 8 billion people populate the planet connected to an internet, and you can basically talk to all of them and find those that you are vibing with. You can build things with it. It's a place in the history of the planet that never existed. But unfortunately, it's a place that by itself is not sustainable. And it's going to burn itself out after a few generations, it seems, because we don't know how to make it sustain itself. And I think that AI gives us the ability to model into the future much more deeply. Right now, our civilization doesn't have a plan for the future anymore. And I think that's the reason why we have this big societal depression and anomia that we are observing. It's very normal that you don't have children if you don't believe in the future anymore. It's very normal that you don't build institutions if you don't know what they're going to regulate, how they're going to deal with global warming anymore, and with the incoherence of our societies. And I think if we have systems that allow us to model the outcomes of our actions very deeply, we will stop lying to each other. We will stop lying to ourselves, and we can find solutions for the problems that can be solved with intelligence. So um, these are the reasons why I think this is the most important thing to build. I also think that's, uh, that San Francisco might be the place that needs it most. <laughs>